It's a nice sunny day here in Southern California, so I thought I'd take a stroll by the beach. The view is just beautiful today. Of course, it's usually beautiful, something I never get tired of, so I'm glad I can share it with you. The song in the intro is called Eternal Flame, and while it's meant to be a love song, the title reminds me of an ancient religion which flourished in places like Babylon, the Persian Empire, and areas influenced by the ancient Phoenicians, where, like the sun, a lit fire or even candle represented light and would be kept burning continuously, a true eternal flame. Starting around the time of the 12th century in Europe, around the Adriatic Sea, which is a body of water separating the Italian peninsula from the Balkans, arose a powerful influence called the Venetians, after the city of Venice, who they themselves traced their lineage back to the city of Tyre, on the coast of the eastern Mediterranean, which was the capital city of the Phoenician Empire. These people could be called Canaanites, a term which comes from Canaan, who according to the Bible was a son of Ham. Ham was a son of Noah, and the father of Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Many people hear these terms and incorrectly associate them with Sub-Saharan Africans because they're associated with African civilizations and are today populated by a demographic primarily composed of a black phenotype. But keep in mind that we're talking about thousands of years ago, not modern times, but ancient kingdoms which no longer resemble the ancient kingdoms described in the Old Testament. So for example, it should not be surprising that the DNA of pharaohs differs from many modern Egyptians, or that modern Ethiopians, which today is a highly mixed population, is not the same as those described in the Bible, such as the Queen of Sheba, or the allegedly blonde angels who, according to Ethiopian myth, built the stone churches of Lalibela, filled with depictions of a fair-skinned race, swastikas, and Templar crosses inside of Solomon's seal. So the term Phoenician, which means red, comes from the Greeks, and the term Canaanite came from the people who wrote the Old Testament. In any event, they were a powerful seafaring civilization that dominated the Levant, Mediterranean Sea, and North Africa, regardless of who lives there today. These Hamites, or Canaanites, were not Sub-Saharan African, and according to recent DNA sequencing, share genetic affinities with modern Europeans. They grew very wealthy and powerful through trade, they were merchants, and their vast trade network helped spread the alphabet that many of us around the world use today. History tells us that they suffered several major military defeats, starting around the time of the Bronze Age Collapse, which collapsed the Hittites and Egyptian empires, but the Phoenicians, however, survived and even thrived for a while until Alexander the Great attacked Tyre in 332 BC during his conquest of the Persian Empire and on his way to taking Egypt. Alexander's Macedonian army was initially unable to capture the city through conventional means because it was on an island that had walls right up to the sea, allegedly standing 150 feet tall, which is probably an exaggeration but the island was very well fortified. Alexander's request was simple. He wished to sacrifice to Hercules in Tyre. The Phoenician refusal to capitulate to Alexander's wishes was tantamount to a declaration of war. In a last-ditch attempt to prevent a long and exhaustive siege, 
he dispatched heralds to Tyre demanding their surrender, but the Macedonians were executed and their bodies hurled into the sea. The details of what happened over the next several months were very dramatic and quite exciting, but would make this video too long. But in a summary, Alexander's forces were eventually able to breach the walls, slaughtered most of the Phoenician forces, including crucifying thousands, and then he held a procession through the streets of the city, where Alexander then made his sacrifice to Hercules. With Tyre subjugated, Alexander could turn his attention to subduing Egypt. Of course, the Phoenicians survived in other colonies, such as Carthage, which was eventually defeated by the Romans during the Punic Wars. But their ancient Canaanite religion and influence survived covertly through the Roman Empire, rising again to prominence through the use of banking and usury in Europe. Usury means lending money at unreasonably high interest rates. From about 800 AD on, Venice was an increasing power in the Mediterranean. The Bank of Venice established in 1157 was the first national bank to have been established within the boundaries of Europe. It became a great sea power, which became a dictatorship over the Mediterranean around the time known by historians as the Fourth Crusade. Now I understand that there are those that like to claim that the Crusades had something to do with Christianity, but this is only the surface story which I will get into more detail in a future presentation. The Venetians disseminated their ancient cults in the form of secret societies, as well as imposing debt wherever they could, usually by covertly manipulating kingdoms or city-states into waging wars with each other, financing both sides, plunging Europe into war with a divide-and-conquer propaganda campaign. They were involved in ritualistic cruelty, sexual deviancy, and maintained their ancient tradition of sacrifice. The existing political institutions of Europe collapsed around 1250 to 1267 in a series of wars and invasions by the Venetian allies penetrating into Europe from Eurasia. Then, in the middle of the 14th century, there was a chain reaction of bankruptcy, starting with the King of England, who decided that his tremendous debts brought about by usury was evil, satanic, and decided that these debts were sinful and refused to pay to the major banking families that had already looted most of Europe. Of course, this banking structure eventually moved north and took over London, and today the tradition continues through the IMF, and Rothschild banking dynasty, who greatly influenced global finance, media, corporations, and politics. In 1000, the Byzantine Empire uh, underwent a fundamental crisis. That was the period when Venice started to take over more and more of Europe, and eventually the power center shifted to the financial oligarchy in Venice. So then, uh, in, two, in 1066, the Normans uh, took over England and the Saxons got defeated. And then eventually, Venice for a very long time remained the power center of the imperial structure. So you are really looking at a succession of different empires. Now, naturally, Venice in this period, in this long period, underwent changes, family changed replaced others, but the oligarchical structure eventually, essentially remained the same. The Venetians are very good at psychological warfare as well. That if you read uh, Friedrich Schiller's Ghost Seer, you can see that you, what you do is you pretend to be people's friends. You find out what they want, what their weakness is, and you give it to them. If they want money, you give them money. If they want sex, you arrange for that. If they want drugs, you arrange for that. Whatever it is they want, their weaknesses, you feed them. And then you tell them, okay, I'm doing all this for you and I just need these little favors. And you corrupt them. And you corrupt them until you can control them. And of course, 
you know what they're doing so you can always blackmail them if they try to get out of line. But basically what controls them is the knowledge that if they don't go along with you, then they lose out on all these things they like. You know, if they play ball with you, then <clears throat> they become rich, they become famous, they have all of their desires sated, they get everything that they want, in a, but in a mental state which is increasingly depraved and subject to manipulation. And that's also the Venetian method, that you win by corruption. And that the, you, the thing that the empire fears most of all is an honest man who isn't corruptible because he doesn't want those things. With their reassurance of complete maritime dominance, the Venetian oligarchy used their power over the Mediterranean to internationally centralize the control and organization of money within their financial empire. Thus, no country could produce bullion for its own use, and all currency exchange had to take place in Venice. They are lending money to the major houses of Europe, the major, the nations, or what passed for nations at that point, the, you know, the kingdom, various kingdoms and duchies and things like that. And so they get them into debt. Now, for example, the King of England was in significant debt to the Lombard bankers, which was the Venetian, the Venetian banking system, and in particular to the House of Bardi. And so the king, you know, pledged the, as collateral, the wool production of his kingdom. And then, he, of course, he's going broke, and so he needs more money, so he borrows more money, and then he pledges the, all of the sheep as well. The key thing about this kind of debt, debt farming, is that once you incur a debt, the debt never really goes away. Because they're, the interest rates that you have to pay, the money that you have to pay to service this debt is such that you quit building your country and you start trying to pay your debt. And then you have to borrow more money to pay your debt because you get further behind and then your interest rates get higher, your debt service becomes more, and you set off on a process that never really ends until everything blows up. But that's the Venetian method of control. And that method has not changed since the days of Venice. The oligarchy proceeded to move north in search of a new capital from which to operate. They settled throughout northern Europe, opening their first major headquarters in Amsterdam, Holland. Centuries later, they consolidated their true base in 1763 upholding their public political headquarters in London, which remains still today. The Baroque is a highly ornate and often extravagant style of architecture, music, painting, sculpture, and other arts that flourished in Europe from the early 17th until the mid 18th century. It followed the Renaissance style, with great innovations in dance appearing in the 17th century, originating at the French court under Louis XIV. And it is here that we see the first clear stylistic ancestor of classical ballet. Louis XIV was a major influence in the development and promotion of Baroque dance. Even at the age of 14, Louis was an accomplished dancer as the sun god Apollo, an image that he was to cultivate throughout his life. Puissance. Plaisir.
During the 17th century, dancing had not only a great social importance, but could also carry political importance. Although celebrating traditions with masquerade balls had been around since the 14th century and all throughout the era of the Renaissance, mass balls did not really come to Europe until the 17th century. Hiding one's identity is the theme behind wearing masks at masquerade events, and particular masquerades were for the wealthy and posh, which required an exclusive invitation to participate. There was a strict code of conduct and behavior which had to be followed, and everyone had to come in full costume. Baroque means irregular in French, and is said to originate from the Portuguese word baroco, meaning imperfect pearl like the irregular shaped pearl that was used in the jewelry of the time. The Carnival of Venice is an annual festival held in Venice, Italy that ends with the Christian celebration of Lent 40 days before Easter, the day before Ash Wednesday. The festival is world famous for its elaborate masks and currently seems to be growing in popularity since around the 80s or 90s. However, under the rule of the Holy Roman Emperor and later Emperor of Austria, Francis II, the festival was outlawed entirely in 1797 and the use of the masks became strictly forbidden. It reappeared gradually in the 19th century but only for short periods and usually for private feasts with rumored ritualistic activities. Did you know Stanley Kubrick filmed his famous movie Eyes Wide Shut inside the Rothschild family's country estate? Theories swirled that Kubrick made his movie about the real-life ultra-elite and their secret occultic gatherings. Well, take a look at these pictures that show an actual Rothschild event from 1972. On the surface, it looks like a pretty magnificent surrealist ball, but there are clear occult references. Much like the film Eyes Wide Shut, occult imagery is hidden throughout the night, starting with the invitations, which were written backwards. Reversal or inversion of sacred objects is typical of black magic and satanic rituals. The exterior of the Chateau de Ferrier is lit up in a moving orange light, giving it the appearance of a fiery inferno. This hat, designed by Dali, also has hidden symbolism of androgyny by having half of Mona Lisa's face. Harnessing the male and female power is important to practitioners of the left-hand path. And although Dali traditionally paints ants and grasshoppers in his paintings to evoke death, decay, and trauma, this work of art has scarab beetles, which symbolize the Egyptian mysticism of Osiris, the Sun King. This guest's costume resembles the famous painting Son of Man by Magritte. Both the apple and the eye of Horus symbolize the forbidden knowledge of Lucifer in the Garden of Eden. The hostess, Marie Helene de Rothschild, is seen wearing a giant horned head, crying real diamond tears. Is this a representation of the sacrifice to Baphomet, who will share wealth and riches only after sacrifice? It's not exactly clear when in 1972 this party took place, but from the look of the decorations and the menu, it's definitely a fertility ritual. The dinner table serves dismembered dolls and cracked skulls. For dessert, a human sacrifice in a bed of roses. The rose, of course, is a symbol used by many secret societies, and it represents virginity, fertility, sexuality, and immortality, as well as silence and secrecy. Here's Salvador Dali, who helmed the Surrealist movement. 
At first, this could seem like a surrealism party in his honor. But consider the aims of the surrealism movement itself, to resolve the contradictory condition of dreams versus reality, and allow the unconscious mind to express itself. Occult imagery is very real, and it's everywhere, in movies, television, music, and fashion. The power derived from these occult symbols and imagery is very real to the elitists that congregate in their separate reality. So shall we burn thee once again this night, and in the flames that eat thine effigy, we shall read the sign, Midsummer sets us free! You shall burn me once again! <laughs> And that is just the tip of the iceberg. The elites are riddled with perverse secret societies that are obsessed with harnessing the power of dark forces. There's the public perception of the occult and then what is actually happening. It's fantasy and folklore versus the real intangible dark power that the elite are able to harness by being practitioners of the occult. And it's this very art and imagery that we see over and over again that it's just the expression of their dark souls. My name is Robert Sepper. Thank you for watching, sharing, subscribing, and don't forget to leave a comment. See you soon.